quality of the program. Absolutely. Um, so just a reminder, this event is being recorded and it's being streamed live on Facebook. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and I'll get us kicked off. We've got such an awesome program for you all today. <clears throat> okay. Now, allegedly, you all should see. Heather, I need one second, please. Not launching. I'm going to redo it. Okay. Now I don't know how to unraise my hand. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so it's being live streamed and recorded. Now we're good to go? Yes. Awesome. Okay, great. So uh, my name is Heather Fiziak. I am the outgoing chair of the membership meetings uh, committee. Uh, welcome to our April 8th League of Women Voters meeting. We have an awesome program for you today, all about Gen Z at the ballot box. Um, so we will kick it off with a fireside chat with the amazing Donovan Dillon, a community organizer at Loud Light. And then we have a fantastic presentation coming up after that with energizing young voters. So we have Agnes, Lily, and Pat, all from that organization who are gonna walk us through some awesome content they put together for us. Uh, we'll wind down the end of the meeting with committee announcements, our social media minute, and any final calls to action we have for the group. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna get right into the exciting programming that we have today. Again, we're talking Gen Z at the ballot box. Uh, so a, a handful of us in the League of Women Voters, Kansas City, uh, Jackson, Clay, and Platt counties, we went to an event, uh, I think it was late last year, right, folks, where it was a panel of Gen Z voters, and it really sparked a great conversation about um, how to help this generation get more involved in the political process and the electoral process. And so to that end, we uh, brought some uh, really great speakers today. So first, we're going to start with this um, fireside chat with Donovan Dillon. And so he's a community organizer with Loud Light. Um, I'm going to let him actually do his opening intro because it's overwhelmingly awesome. But we know that he's worked extensively with campus organizing. Uh, he works to create community partnerships around civic engagement. And it's all aimed toward mobilizing this next generation of young people to bring substantive change to Kansas. So we have a lot to learn from you, Donovan. Um, tell us a little bit more about your organization. What is it that you all are doing? Yeah, so thank you for that intro. Um, just again, my name is Donovan Delaney, as he have pronouns. Um, so Loud Light is a youth voting rights organization. That's what we are founded as. Um, an attempt to um, bring political power to like historically marginalized groups. So young people, people of color, um, rural voters, especially here in Kansas, and to really like help have them help them have a political home here in our state and also find their political voice. And we do that through a lot of different ways. Um, we really prioritize voter registration, um, informative videos during the legislative session. We work across different coalitions on various issues because we know that young people don't just care about voting, uh, they care about LGBTQ plus rights, um, abortion, and a uh, myriad of different other issues and then we do a lot of different civic engagement events and informational events like this and then we focus a lot on youth voter turnout um we've worked extensively on the vote no, no campaign um this um, legislative session i work to coordinate state house lobby uh lobbying visits um and just do like a lot of great work that not only centers young people but is also ran by young people um six of our 10 staff are under the age of 24 um, and come from various different backgrounds. So yeah, that's just a little bit about Loud Light. Okay, so how did you personally find yourself involved with this cause and with this organization? Is there something that drew you to it? Yeah, so I actually got involved with like organizing slash advocacy before I really even knew it. Um, it was probably about the age of like 14. 
Um, and it all just started off. I used to be a pretty shy person and around in high school, I was like, I might as well get involved. Like I really enjoyed like kind of like nerdy activities. I was an orchestra band, uh, just all the different things. Um, and I got like more involved and through that, I really started caring about and valuing community. Um, that's like a very big value of mine. And through that, I mean, you start meeting new people from different backgrounds, you start caring about them. And then when different systems or uh, structures start harming them, um, that causes you to take action. I mean, you care about these people and like community. Um, yeah, and I think my first ever protest that I planned was in the Rotunda, Lawrence High School. Um, there was an instance where a transgender student was being bullied um, and that, kind of like through my like senior year, um, we like solved that issue. Um, we worked on getting our first gender neutral bathroom um, and our high schools actually remodeled during the pandemic and all of the bathrooms are gender neutral. Um, more specifically, it allowed that I got involved on our student power campaign. Um, I saw the post for the uh, fellowship on social media and I was like, this looks amazing. I applied. Um, and got to do some super amazing work on expanding voting access on college campuses. Um, and then I got a job offer after that and have been with Hellbite ever since, and it's been amazing. Bravo, already so accomplished and yet still so new in this space. I mean, just a, a few years really being dedicated in this way and so impactful in such a short time. So in your experience and in your work in this space, what, and as a Gen Z member yourself, correct? So yeah. what do you think are some of the most pressing issues to this generation in upcoming elections? Oh, wow. That's, that's a big one because I think everything is like such a big issue at this point. Um, I mean, uh, bodily autonomy, abortion, LGBTQ plus rights, um, guns, uh, the economy. I mean, just everything across the board. I think something that's like pretty new with Gen Z is that like, you can't just really care about one thing. Um, I think there are, there are so many issues across the board that our nation faces that it's really hard to just center one thing and prioritize that as like a voter or someone who's trying to be civically engaged. So I think across the board, you see people really tuning into like multiple issues because we have to like view the way that they like impact each other and impact us as young people. I mean, like being young, like uh, I, I'm a sophomore in college now, but when I was going into college, um, I mean, like the cost of like college, like the cost of like apartments, like really impacted me, um, tuition, things like that. And then from like this other perspective, like, wow, like, will I be able to like have access to like good curriculum? Like how does like uh, policy in like the state house like impact my future? So it's kind of really just this like intersectional approach to like civic engagement and just like kind of being aware of everything all at once. It's interesting. So gone are the days of the single issue voter in, in Gen Z, it sounds like. And it sounds like it's almost kind of overwhelming, right? There's a, dozens of different issues that are affecting your lives on any given day. They're all interconnected. It's very complex. How is your generation coping? I that's a that's a good question. I think our generation has like really had to prioritize like mental health. Um, and I don't think there's like a perfect like solution to that, but I mean like growing up um, in a world where like we, I mean, it's hard to like protect us from like the ills of like society. I mean, you have kids, like you go to school thinking you're going to get an education and you're worried, more worried about like um, school shooter coming in, things like that. So, um, and then you just like throw in social media and access to information. I could hop on social media and my entire feed could be filled with just like bad things happening across the country. So I really think we've had to do a lot of work on like prioritizing like mental health um, and just like our own well-being. But I think that's true for other generations too, as like we move into this like more digital age and issues grow bigger and like more like they're on your front doorstep. Like it's hard to like ignore them. Yeah. And so speaking of, of uh, you know, social media and all this information, disinformation that's out there, um, you know, I think we've generally all kind of acknowledged this shift in the in the political climate in the mm -hmm. last six, 
10 years or so. So it, it's become this heightened polarization, this heightened division. How is that playing into or affecting Gen Z voting behavior? I actually think that's like a really interesting topic to dive into because I think one of the issues is that the people in positions of power now are typically older and they're arguing the political issues of their time. And they're really putting an effort to like prioritize those. Um, and I think um, even like across like party lines with Gen Z voters that there's a lot more common ground than like people think. I mean, like we have like politicians now who don't really understand like gender, like sexuality. And I think just growing up in the age of like my generation, not everybody might have like the same opinions on the matter, but we're not like debating like whether like racism exists, sexism exists. And these like kind of like more like archaic, if you will, um, political like talking points. Um, and there's like a lot of like common ground um, between like Gen Z voters, even across like party lines. Interesting. Uh, I, I, I actually like immediately wrote something down because that was very insightful to me. So I just kind of want to reiterate what I heard. The people who are representing you now are arguing the political issues of their time, not the issues of your generation or the world that you will be living in. Yes. That, that was just sort of a mind blowing moment of empathy for me as well. So I just wanted to call that out because it was so moving to hear that for a minute, because I think that empathy and understanding for what they're doing might be the way to change minds to, to better represent you all. So um, speaking of political parties, you mentioned that. Do Gen Z voters tend to align with a, a specific party? Are they more independent voters? Who does represent you? I, I think to young voters, it's so tiring to put yourself in the box of like being at a party because because like I can just say it myself. I've been more I've been upset with Democrats just as I have with Republicans, Independents. Like it doesn't really matter the party much as as much as like the action behind your words as a candidate. Um, I think if we look back to the August Second Amendment, you can see that young people really care about. Um, when you take the candidate out of the picture, you can see that more people are willing to participate because I have a direct action on the impact of my vote. If I'm voting for a candidate per se, um, and they have like a lot of like lip service, like all of the things that they're going to do or all of these promises, that's a lot less um, motivating to like vote behind, I guess. Because um, you see time and time again, politicians like come with like these big promises and they don't deliver on them. Um, and as I was talking about earlier, like Gen Z like aren't like one policy issues. Like you can be as great for the economy or like great on two issues. But if you're against like the LGBT plus community, like I'm not going to want to support you. Like I'm not going to want to back you as a candidate, even if you are good on these other issues. And I think like things like that are really something that like our generation is like paying attention to um, and impacts the candidates that we support. I think across the board, something that I've seen is that um, as younger people start running for office, those are really the allies we start seeing. Um, even across party lines here in Kansas, I know that, um, I don't know exactly what they call themselves, but there's a uh, caucus of younger legislators. That's really where you see bipartisanship happening. And even though it might not be agreements on like um, a lot of like the uh, very like popular issues, we do see a lot of like bipartisanship on their effort and in introducing of bills that like our generation cares about and more cooperation on those issues than older generations. My mind is already blown, you guys. So um, I've got a couple more questions here for you, but folks, I'm sure you're already brimming with questions and things you want to talk about. Um, so you are welcome to either type your question into chat and I will get to those, or you can use the hand raise feature and I'll cue you up in the order that I see your hands to pose questions to Donovan. Um, and while you all are thinking about those great questions, 
Uh, Donovan, tell me a little bit more about your work with uh, registering Gen Z voters, getting uh, Gen Z voters to turn out at the elections. What's working? What's not? What can we learn from what you all are doing? Yeah, so I have been doing voter reg, oh my God, for quite some time now. And I would say young people are not apathetic to civic engagement. I think what a lot of issues with like um, getting young people involved, getting young people registered, is that the system was not made to benefit us or cater to us in any way. I mean, you have to like think of like the context of young people who are coming into voting age. We're graduating high school, we're going to college. Um, I mean, most kids like maybe get like an optional civics credit um, in high school, one of their years. Like we aren't growing up like learning the system unless that comes from like your home. Um, and then we're getting thrown into a world. You have to learn like school, you either go to school or you start working, balancing that um, and then learning about the voting process, which I mean, in this day and age can change every legislative session. We see bills that, you know, impact like uh, voter registration dates, like when your mail-in ballot can go in and this just ever-changing system. and it's really hard to like get people tied into that. Like we know voting to be like a learned behavior. And once you start doing it, you continue to do it, but it's getting people educated enough to plug in. And I think in regards to like uh, voter registration, like voter information drives, we really have to move past, you know, just sitting at a table um, and expecting young people to come up and register to vote. Like we really have to start being more innovative in the way that we do voter registration, more engaging, um, and also realizing that it doesn't, you know, have to be sitting at a table. Like there's ways that you can utilize social media. Um, I think there's like different organizations who I know like do like voter registration at like music festivals and concerts. Like there are so many more ways that I think we can be innovative in regards to voter registration um, that I personally and like my, um, time have like utilized um just like on my campus we used to do like donuts and democracy where um people going to their morning classes we'd get like a bunch of donuts play some music uh line up on um wesco beach it's like this little uh hall like outside there's like a lot of space and we just like walk up to be like hey like are you registered to vote and then if they say yes are you registered to vote in kansas because you know you go to school here and that was like a really good way to get a lot of people registered to vote. So just being like more innovative in the way that we approach it and also not viewing Gen Z as like apathetic or like disengaged. I think that's really harmful and does us a disservice because like I said before, this space wasn't made for us to exist in. So approaching us with like this negative attitude, I doesn't, I don't think does us a service and getting us more engaged or the people trying to get us engaged a service and building that broader um, voter base. Fascinating. And another kind of mind blowing moment of empathy. I, I have to pause and just reiterate something you just said. It's it's not that young people are apathetic about civic engagement. It's that this system wasn't built for us. Once again, it was it was built for a system and a generation and issues of a different time. And it hasn't necessarily, are, are you saying that it hasn't necessarily evolved to meet the needs of the, and interests of the, of the current generation? And and what what does a system look like that does? I mean, like, just for an example, I'll give you context to like, my campus. I mean, in order to vote, you need to one, have um, your like IDs in order, um, your address. Um, if you're getting a mail-in ballot, you have to like know where to get that like mailed to, whether that be your dorm or home. Um, for people who live in Kansas, you have to make the decision, am I going to vote on campus or am I going to go home to vote? Like there are all of these like questions. And then um, in regards, I mean, like I've been in the state house so much this legislative session. Um, they're trying to get rid of things like the three day grace period, which I, uh, for college students is like a big impact to like how many people can vote. Um, in regards to, I mean, like my ballot has to go through a college campus mail room ran by college students. That's after it's mailed. We don't have that many mailing centers in the state. So I have to like make sure my ballot 
it's just like all this like mental math. And if you're voting in person on campus, like, do I have a car? Um, do voting times align with my class schedule? Um, are they publicizing like uh, public uh, voting locations enough to me for me to even know where to vote? Like there's all these different like compounding factors that play a role. And I think like recognizing those and trying to like move forward is like a really big thing. Um, one of the things that I'm like really glad that we have here is a really good um, county election clerk who does like really amazing work around like making sure our elections are like accessible for people, not just young people, old people, um, working people, things like that. So I think in regards to like voting, like um, you really have to pay attention to some of those like local candidates. I mean, at the end of the day, your state can pass whatever laws it will, but um, your county elections clerk has like a lot to say about how um, elections are implemented locally um, in regards to like accessibility, um, how like uh, voting locations, voting hours, stuff like that. Awesome. So I'm gonna um, start queuing up a couple questions that we got in the chat here. Um, and we had one hand raiser, we're just double checking for security sake real quick, and then we'll let them come on and ask their question. Um, all right, so uh, first, you mentioned something about how politicians don't necessarily execute on the things that we told them to do in the ballot box. And that is challenging for your generation to have belief in a system that, that doesn't do that. So let's talk about accountability and holding elected officials accountable. Laura and David Mountjoy ask, um, how do young voters plan to or hope to hold your elected officials accountable? So I think young people, um, particularly in my generation, have used uh, disruptive organizing and social media to our advantage when it comes to holding elected officials accountable. Um, I think social media has become like a really good tool for this um, because I don't think our generation necessarily is bound geographically and connecting with each other and sharing information, which I think is amazing. So I've noticed that like a lot of like, I mean, activists on like social media use that as a tool for showing elected officials in like their true light. Um, I think it's very, like a lot of politics happens like behind doors. It's really hard to, you know, like go to like your state house every day, things like that. Or like not everyone can make, you know, every city commission meeting, but when information is shared on um, elected officials and like their intentions and the acts that they're doing, a lot of times people don't recognize until an article goes out after the fact saying, this politician pushed forward this bill, this bill passed. And that's been like a really great way for people to kind of organize around these issues and bring attention to them, which drives kind of like a lot of that action. And I think like social media has done like insanely crazy things. Like even for me, like um, there was um, a TikToker who raised over 2 million for um, abortion access in Texas um, through social media. Um, there were two TikTokers who did like a 30 day live stream and they raised over 2 million for trans individuals to have access to healthcare. So I think social media has been like a really cool tool for disruptive organizing and calling politicians out on their bull crap. Uh, that's very, very interesting. And so speaking of holding people accountable, uh, there are a lot of bills coming out that are really aimed at repressing uh, the younger generation of voters or some of these new and different ways of casting our ballot. How uh, are you, your organization, or your generation, whatever point of view you want to answer from, uh, addressing these issues and bills that are out right now? No. So I think we take a, like, two-pronged approach to this. So in one way, there's, I mean, like how the system works, like um, engaging with like the political process. I mean, in the state house, like bills get introduced, they have hearings. Um, I spend a lot of time, you know, coordinating testimony. I basically use like 
uh, reach out to people. I say, hey, I know that you care about X issue in the state house. They are putting forth this bill that will impact us in this way. Can you support, uh, can you write testimony in like opposition and submit that? Um, if they can come in person, that's great. Um, just so that like young people have a voice in our state house nine times out of 10, that voice is ignored. Um, and then, you know, like having people email their elected officials, call their elected officials, meet with them in public, go to their public events, things like that, which is kind of, you know, how the system is supposed to work. But we know that that, we don't live in a perfect world where that works with every politician or that every politician values that, um, or that that will necessarily have the biggest effect on them. So that's why we do organizing outside of the system that already exists because we know that that system can be imperfect. So that's having people go out and like canvas, like showing up to politicians and, you know, demanding that they represent their constituents. Um, and then Loud Light also does a lot of work um, in like the legal field. Um, so we have had like a couple of lawsuits, like I was a plaintiff in the redistricting case where they basically gerrymandered the state um, and that impacted people of color, um, young people. Um, and it was just like a really big issue. Um, we've also had a couple of lawsuits um, in regards to, you know, voting rights. Um, we actually just had a decision on a case that basically um, kind of like with like the abortion, how abortion is like protected under the Kansas constitution. It basically kind of said the same thing about voting. So also like making sure that there are like building up that like legal protections in the state for these things that you need to frankly have these protections with all of these bills coming out of the legislature. So I've got an interesting challenge question for you here. Okay. It's kind of a combination of a couple questions here. And it's about the quantity, the number of Gen Z potential voters out there. And it's kind of a chicken and egg question. Are, are, are politicians more likely to cater to a to this generation if you were voting in larger numbers? Or would you be voting in larger numbers if the generation felt like the politicians were catering better to them? You know, what, where's the cause and effect between the voters and the politicians? I, I think it's kind of a mixed bag. Like, I don't think there's a perfect answer to that question or that's something that everyone is like looking for. What I can say though, just like being a young person in this space and like having been in community with like younger organizers is that younger people are very politically engaged. Not necessarily if that looks like what we tend to think that looks like as in like voting every day, but younger people are politically engaged. And I think as like more younger people start getting into the political space, whether that be through advocacy, running for office, running campaigns, um, uh, working just in like the advocacy space, I think we will see more young people participating. And I mean like, not all of Gen Z is of like voting age yet. So we also have to take th take things like that into consideration. Um, sorry, I was like reading a comment in the chat. But yeah, I don't think there's a perfect answer to that question, but I do think younger people will continue to get more politically engaged and continue to show up as long as we are doing the work to make sure that they get tapped into like voting and the process of that. Awesome. Uh, and, and on that note, so you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, that there's this this dangerous misperception that Gen Z voters are apathetic. And I think from the uh, experiences in, in the league, we also see this very dangerous misconception that uh, your vote doesn't matter or, or this feeling that your vote doesn't matter. I'm sure you encounter that a lot as you're talking to Gen Z voters on the ground. Um, how, how are you talking with people about that? What do you tell them? I think we have to be honest with ourselves because there's a reason why people think that their vote doesn't matter and that's valid. Like, I don't think... Um, I don't think that like saying like, hey, you feel this way and that's invalid will ever bridge any gaps or get anyone involved. 
what I tend to do is I use my personal experience and what I know to be true as in like, Hey, like, I know that like politicians can frankly be quite like shitty people. They don't always keep their promises. Um, and they're pretty imperfect. I know that in Kansas, we have a Republican supermajority and like, we may not get everything we want. Um, and I think a lot of times, sadly, in our state, it ends up being around like harms reduction. Like, I know that we might not expand Medicaid. I know we might not legalize cannabis. But if your your vote can impact on whether like trans people in this state have access to health care, your vote can impact whether your school gets funded and special education gets funded, things like that. Or like, I mean, either have been racist who've been, that have been decided down by a couple of votes. Things like that really have an impact on what people see. And I think especially like putting that down to like a more local level and more personal level really plays an impact. I mean, I, if I'm like, oh yeah, like your vote will decide like if our next president is like a Democrat or Republican, that's, that's not gonna carry much weight. But like really like centering it down to like a local and personal level and leveraging our personal experiences and narratives, I think really does a lot of work. And also um, recognizing their concerns and like uh, what the system is about, because I mean, our system isn't perfect. And there are reasons why young people, old people, people of color feel this way. Fascinating. Um, I'm going to um, bring in a couple questions from the audience now. Um, we have Alag Gross from, uh, well, he's in Missouri and he's a candidate for attorney general. So uh, a lot, are you on and would you mind just popping on and asking your question for us today? Sure. Can you all hear me? Okay. Sure can. Great. Donovan, this is, this is really wonderful. And all of this being put on, uh, you know, I'm on the St. Louis side, uh, work with the league quite a bit over here, but, uh, especially given some of the recent activities that, uh, news and everything else, this has been, uh, really, really heartening in so many ways. So Donovan, thank you so much for presenting and talking about all of this. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to know your perspective specifically on, you know, I'm so I'm a candidate right now. Um, I have run for office before. We focused a lot on getting young people involved and not just, you know, I hated those, I've been a candidate, uh, uh, somebody who helped out candidates and you get those who are just, you know, go make these copies, go deliver this, go do that. And it's not that great of a, of an experience, you know? Um, and what, what I think is super important is to give folks not only, you know, basic experience and how a campaign works, but also responsibility because you have more buy-in, you'll learn a lot more, and then you get to go on and do, you know, awesome things afterwards. Uh, what, what do you believe is the best way for candidates to engage young people, but also to give them those skills so that they can take whatever they learn from that afterwards, uh, support them afterwards. And, and what kind of things do you want to see candidates do, frankly? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I've worked, I think, on a campaign at kind of like every level of like race. Um, I think not viewing young people as like the intern, like you viewing them as like, oh, like you're a fellow, um, really recognizing that young people do some of the most innovative work in the political space and the advocacy space and the activism space. And I think if, I think every campaign should hire young people and not just hire young people, but pay young people for their work. I get that that may not look like, you know, like a whole salary, depending on like your campaign and like situation, but I think treating young people um, as experts in their lived experience, as in what they can bring to the table um, and treating them with kindness, compassion, um, and also, you know, paying them for their work, um, not just like an experience. I think that that is really, frustrating as like a young person I think um especially like I know campaigns can be like a lot of work to expect me to put like in like 15 20 hours a week for nothing in return except experience I mean like just as like other people have like bills to pay like things to do so do young people and our time I think is especially valuable with you know school and other things um 
but also just in regards to like being a candidate, just like being genuine. I mean, we're all people. Like I can't relate to you as a person, as a candidate, if you're not showing me who you are. And I mean, like people can't be like experts in everything, but also like leveraging like your lived experience and like what you know and your values, I think does like a lot of great work for young people in this space. Thank you. Apologies. All right, so uh, Riva Capillari, I'm going to cue you up next to ask your question if you'd like to come on now. Okay, thank you, Donovan, so much for being here. I'm uh, like um, our former, uh, the person who just spoke, I'm also uh, really heartened by all of what you're saying. Um, we have a bad system. I don't think the system works for a lot of us, to be honest with you. I don't think it's just young people. I think it's for a lot of us, including me. I mean, I I, I just think that when we get a minority in power, um, we have to find another system that's going to work. So um, how do you, I mean, I think that voting, unfortunately, what the system we have is the system we have right now. How do you think you guys can help change this system since you do have a lot of power? I mean, the reason they're repressing your vote is because they realize how powerful you guys are. And um, how can you how can you use the current system um, to change it? I, I, okay. I'm, I look at this question from like two ways. First, I think it's very annoying and disheartening for people in positions of power to look to young people to change a system when they're the ones in power and can do it themselves. Two, I think young people don't typically like don't try to change the system from the inside out. One, because we're not welcome on the inside. I mean, like I've been in this space for, since I was 14, I'm 20 now. I've been in this space for six years and I go to the Capitol and I get treated like dirt. Uh, people don't wanna meet with me. People don't take me seriously. I mean, I've been working at my job at this nonprofit for two years. I'm always the youngest person in the room usually. Um, and just like all the hurdles that you have to go through from like trying to change something from the inside out when you're not welcome on the inside is really disheartening. I think old people need to stop saying, oh, like the next generation got this, like when they get into office, no, you're in office now, you start making those changes so that we don't have to not only like fight for our generation and our time, but fix the mistakes of yours. Uh, strong words of accountability coming out of Gen Z there, folks. We better keep up the, the good work. Um, so we need to wind down the live portion of this, but Donovan, there are probably 20 questions in the chat that we didn't get to. Uh, so if you're able to stick around for the second half of the program and maybe hop into the chat here and, and respond to people, I think they really love your perspective. Um, everybody, please give a warm round of applause to our guest, Donovan Dillon from Loud Light. Uh, Donovan, so uh, just to clarify, uh, is, is Loud Light only in Kansas? Is it a national organization? Are there different states that have it? And how can people learn more about what Loud Light is doing? Yeah, so Loud Light is a Kansas-based org. Um, but like I said, I am the KC Metro organizer. So like, I mean, Kansas City is kind of like Kansas, Missouri. Um, so like, I know like a lot of people who organize in Missouri. And we also have like a lot of like the same issues, uh, but we are Kansas based. We have um, a website that I'll send in the chat, loudlight.org, where you can learn more about our org. And then I highly recommend following us on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Our TikTok is really awesome um, at loud underscore light. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Again, round of applause for Donovan Dillon. Uh, he'll hop into the chat, I think. Yes. And uh, join the conversation there. Uh, and now we're going to cut over to the second part of our program. Um, everyone, please welcome our next guests. 
another perspective on Gen Z. Uh, we've got a presentation from a great group called Energizing Young Voters. Uh, on the phone today, we have uh, Pat Supley, the director of Energizing Young Voters. There you are. Okay, I've got you. And we've got Lily Hardwick. We've got Agnes Roche. And then uh, we had a third speaker, but unfortunately had another commitment come up. But from what I understand, we still have a pretty fantastic program in place today. So I'm going to let you all take over the screen. I'd love for you all to introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about you, the organization, and then feel free to launch right into your programming. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to let uh, Lily and Agnes introduce themselves first, and uh, then we will move on to what we planned for the day. So oh, hello everyone. My name is Lily. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior in high school. And if I'm looking over there, I have two monitors going on right now. And I got involved with the League of Women Voters when I was a freshman. So four years ago, I've been able to be a voting delegate at the national convention. And I work on energizing young voters with Dr. Suffley. Hi everybody, um, my name is Agnes Roach. Um, I'm 20 years old, so I'm a college junior um, here at Middlebury College up in Vermont. Um, I have been a member of the board, the advisory board for Energizing Young Voters for, wow, two years now, I think, two and a half years. Um, I'm very involved with Pat um, in terms of giving presentations through the league and Energizing Young Voters, and I'm very happy to be here today. And I'll add that Agnes is also helping me learn how to write grants so that we win them. <laughs> and uh, that Lily is on her way to college in a with a full ride scholarship. And part of that, I think, is attributable to the kind of person she is that got her involved with us initially. Um, I'm Pat Supley. I'm a lifelong educator. I'm a retired lifelong educator. At least that's what it's supposed to be. But it really isn't right now. I'm, I'm a volunteer for the league in New Jersey in Monmouth County. Um, energizing young voters is one of the things that has become a passion for me. And the chance, the, the opportunity for me to work with people like Lily and Agnes and Netan and Zach, and I could go on and list young people in high school and college who just are amazing and actually what the uh, what energizing young voters does fits so beautifully into what Donovan was just talking about, because I look at us and the energizing young voters program as a vehicle to reach as many young people as possible, and to get them interested and excited about voting, and then making change. So the organization reflects the two goals of the League of Women Voters, empowering voters and defending democracy. Um, I am gonna share my screen and if all goes well, we will have- See the Zoom window, now the slideshow window. How's that? Looks perfect. Okay, good. Um, we began with the concept of what if every single 18 to 29 year old, which is that youngest voting block in the United States became a lifelong voter. So they didn't vote just once, but it was a lifelong habit. How might the world be changed? And came up with the vision that we would do that by helping kids understand why it's important to vote, help them develop the intention to vote, and then be equipped to overcome all barriers to casting a ballot, which is one of the things that Donovan was talking about, but also to encourage them to become the kind of leader that he is right now, um, to understand how the political process brings about change, to develop the confidence and the skills needed to participate in that process, and then to be willing to take a stand and defend democracy. And Agnes, would you tell them what it has done for you in terms of voting? Yes, definitely. Um, so I had the um, the luck and the chance, um, the privilege of joining Energizing Young Voters when I had just turned 18. I started working with Pat in September. My birthday was in July um, and there was the election coming up in November. And um, and so I 
think I'm a pretty good example of a voter who started at 18 and will hopefully um, continue throughout the rest of my life. But one thing I was I was talking um, to Pat about, it was about a month ago now, um, is that energizing young voters, we, we're trying to get young people to engage in voting, so in the national community that they are a part of, but that voting and civic engagement goes so much further than just voting for the president every four years. It's voting in midterm elections. It's participating in your community. It's getting a library card. Um, it's voting for me in my um, student government associations here on campus. Um, it was my first year and I started college halfway through the first semester. Um, and the mid-year elections for student government came up and I went to just, you know, mark the email as read and not vote. And then I was like, whoa, actually, this is, I, I started thinking about what, what energizing young voters is and what civic engagement is. And then it's it's more than just, like I said, voting in presidential elections. It's being an active member of all the communities that you're a part of. Um, and now I have never missed a student government association vote. Um, it's been two and a half years here now at college and I tell all my friends to do it too. Um, and so that's that's what energizing young voters has, has meant to me. Lily, how about you? For me, it was a little bit different than Agnes because I started when I was 14. I got involved when I was very young. I I have, was only allowed to vote for the first time this year. So this was a very cool experience for me. And something that kind of helped me continue and want to do it is by getting involved, but by also being able to spread it with my friends and share it with my school, which we'll talk about in like a future slide. But that civic engagement that I got to bring to my friends and to my community even though I am was born in China. So I am not a natural citizen here. So for me, it was an experience that I could bring to my community, even though something that I could not personally experience right away as many American citizens do originally. Thanks. Okay, so before I begin to fill the slide with all kinds of things, um, when I talk with groups of league members and I should back up a little. This is something that League of Women Voter members can do, and you can do it to the extent that you personally have the time and the interest in doing. But I'm always saying to people, just think about the one thing that you find most intriguing. Each one of these lessons, modules that we call them, um, help to develop a particular um, attitude in st young students. But if you look at all of them, it can be pretty overwhelming. You, we started with one lesson and we're going to give you a little tiny taste of that lesson. And it has grown to the point where it is now. So if you decide that this is something that you want to get involved with and to work in schools and with community groups, um, meaning young community groups with religious organizations, each one of those gives you an opportunity to get in front of young people and encourage them to become those lifelong voters. And as you heard these two young women uh, saying, to also have them become the advocates for others. So remember one. So the first lesson that we developed is called the suffrage timeline. And we know that this lesson and the one that comes after changes students' intention to vote dramatically. This past fall, I made a presentation at Monmouth University the day after election day, midterm elections. There were about 45 people in the room. And I said, how many of you voted yesterday? These were all kids 18 and older. Two hands were raised. We taught the lesson. And I said at the end, okay, suppose I had been here the day before election day. How many of you would have voted? and all but three hands went up in the room. And I was told by the leader, by the, orga you know, the, community, the organizer for this particular group, those three kids are DACA kids. Every single person who was eligible to vote made the change in intention to vote. So the suffrage timeline gives people, adults as well as young people, a uh, concept of what, how difficult it was for people to actually gain the right to vote. So we're gonna give you just a little taste of that. And what I would like you to do is to, as soon as it loads, 
Okay. Students are given the opportunity to have an avatar. And I know the print is small, but just look at that and randomly pick out one of those avatars that you think you would like to be for this game. So I'll give you a minute or less to do that. And then you're gonna get the speed dating version of this. All right, the story begins and it is a story with the Revolutionary War, and that's framed as the first war that we fought for the right to vote and how people suffered and died in order to do that because they wanted representation. We move on to who gets the right to vote initially and ask people to give us the qualities, which were at the time, these four things. And then that's how many people out of that entire group would be eligible to vote and make the decisions for everybody else. And then we move on to 1856, all those people who fought in the War of 1812 and even the Revolutionary War who didn't own property had been fighting for that right. So it changes, property owners taking off. Try to imagine for yourself before I show you the next slide, how many people are making the decision. That's it. And then we move on to the Civil War. And the story goes on how the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments finally led to suffrage for Black men. We cross off white. Try to imagine what you're going to see now. That's it. Move on to the 20th, uh, the 19th Amendment. And Sanja Nabata couldn't be with us here today but she has recorded this section. So I'm going to let you see her and listen to her. If I can find my cursor. Pat, is it playing on your screen? Sorry? I don't think we have the sound connected through. Oh, hang on. I thought I did that. You're right. Maybe we did it on the test round. And then uh, could be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and i looking at this and I'm not seeing that you're seeing the whole screen. Uh, we're not. We're seeing the uh, like full YouTube page, not the yeah. full size video. All right. I am not sure what happened there. These women were called Please suffragists because they were fighting. Oh, no. Susan B. Anthony was one of the most famous suffragists. By the early 1900s, a new generation of women took up the fight. They wanted a constitutional amendment to say that states could not deny the citizens the right to vote based on sex. These women suffragists were unstoppable. They marched, they sued, they lobbied, they picketed outside the White House for more than a year through rain, cold, and blizzards. They were harassed, even by other women, many of whom did not want the vote. When President Woodrow Wilson lost his patience with their picketing, they were arrested. Some suffragists were arrested. They could have paid a small fine to be set free, but they chose to go to jail. They wanted their stories to be told. Some of the jailed suffragists refused to eat. They went on hunger strikes. They wanted people to know that they were willing to die to get the vote. The women on hunger strikes got thinner and thinner and weaker and weaker. They needed help to walk. Their pictures were in the paper and President Woodrow Wilson who refused to support a constitutional amendment for women's suffrage was worried a suffrage, suffragist might die. To make sure they didn't die, the starving suffragists were force fed. They were strapped down, a rubber hose was pushed down their throat to their stomach and liquid food was poured through the hose. Finally, after all these struggles, 
President Wilson gave in. He agreed to support the suffrage amendment and the women were released from jail. The 19th Amendment guaranteeing the wo woman the right to vote was ratified and made into the law of the land in August 1920. However, let's remember that women of color would still have to fight for their vote long after the women's suffrage movement was over. Okay, am I back to the fighting for the vote screen, Agnes and Lily? You are? Yes. Okay, good. All right, um, I shouldn't be. <laughs> I wanted to go back to the screen before this, which had the... Yeah, that one right there. That one, right. Okay, so we needed to now take off mail. Whoops. And this is now what the screen would look like. At this point in time, once most of the kids have uh, seen their avatar, and we make them stand up and sit down when they're doing this, so they're actively engaged in it. We say, but unfortunately, there's more to the story. If you happen to be indigenous, would you please sit down? If you happen to be Latin, X, would you please sit down? If you're Asian Pacific Islander, please sit down. If you're disabled or a black man or a black woman, would you please sit down? And at this point in time, we are almost back to the same number of people making decisions as we were in 1856. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now. And what I'd like to hear from some of you just for a second is what, what if your avatar disappeared, what did that feel like to you? You can unmute yourself and let me know. Heather, you wanna call on people? Sure, well, I was just thinking, gosh, it feels like I don't get to play the game anymore. You know, like I feel left out. Anybody else? Okay, in most cases, we get responses similar to what Heather just said. People, Jim, what did you want to add? Well, I, the, the one thing I guess that I would add is that in given in the current political climate of this, like returning to some era of greatness um, means returning to an era of exclusion. <clears throat> right. Anybody else before I continue? Okay, the, um, the presentation goes on and through the rest of it, there are some students, Lily is one of them, and we have another student, Amira Davis, who talks about the actual fight that people who belong to those groups have had to go through in order to earn the right to vote, not earn, but actually be, get what they're entitled to um, in terms of the vote. That in itself makes kids open their eyes and say, ah, people died and, you know, for this. Uh, so why is that so important? We go on to the next, if I can get back to here now. The second part of that is the truth about turnout. And in this, lesson, their kids are re presented with a series of graphs. And they realize by looking at those and working in small groups that people who are young, people who are um, without much education, people who are um, other than white, don't have the vote. And then they also learn that they're the largest voting bloc right now. So if they did turn out, what power would they have? So those are the two lessons that really change students' intention to vote. And then Donovan, you mentioned something that prompted me. This vote by design, what that teaches kids is that looking at the candidate first is not really the most productive way to learn to vote well. That it's really more important to reflect on your personal values, to reflect on what you see leadership qualities uh, are important, 
and what personal qualities are important to you in the candidates. Students have this ideal leader, they get together in groups and they have to come up with a compromise leader that they can all live with, which of course reflects the fact that not everyone is going to get their perfect leader, that in fact, probably no one is. And then they're um, presented with crises that the particular leader who is up for election right now is likely to face during that term of office. And once they realize that they and they work with those leadership qualities that they think their um, compromise leader is going to have, they have to come up with a five minute introduction to a press release or press conference that the leader would use to let the population know that they've got this under control and that the people are going to be safe and that the problem is going to be solved. <clears throat> so it's looking at leadership from the qualities and then uh, whether or not they can actually do the job. And they talk about the, the uh, qualities of the leaders and so forth. All of these, by the way, you can see the entire lesson and you can see the script that is prepared for teachers or you as league members or students like Lily and Agnes are to use when you're actually presenting this. Module four is casting your ballot. How do you vote? This is actually not just bringing a voting machine to school, but it walks the students through the entire process of voting from uh, identifying the candidates to uh, registering to vote, to uh, getting a sample ballot, to learning the two different ways in New Jersey that we can vote and so forth. And then there's an actual simulation. We also have a student toolkit that they can use, but I wanted you to see, this is uh, about two weeks ago. We were in a high school in a typically underrepresented uh, community. And we had the chance to work with all 700 seniors Students that you see in the upper center picture uh, received, got from the school a list of all of the students who would be eligible to vote by election day in 2024. That would make them 17 or older right now. Every single one of those students was contacted individually by that team of young people to find out if they had registered to vote or not. And if they hadn't been registered, we have automatic registration at. Um, when you get your driver's license, but not all of these young people would be driving um, or get a um, voter ID, a non-voter, non-driving voter ID from the from the government. <clears throat> that was the registration part. The uh, bottom part shows you well. We you can see in the lower left-hand corner if you tilt your head sideways. The county board of elections brought in five voting machines. The kids had the sample ballot, which the county programmed into those five voting machines, and every one of those students had the opportunity to make the choices from their sample ballot, walk up onto the stage, and use the voting machine for the first time and hopefully forever. The comments from students at the end of that were, I used to think it was complicated, now I know it's not. Um, I used to be afraid I'd be embarrassed when I went in, now I know that's not the case, this is really a simple process. So that removes many of the barriers that students feel when they are ready to go vote for the first time. The lessons that we have in the second half reflect the, um, the in, uh, defending democracy part of the league's program. The one way we differ from the league is that the league does take positions on issues and that's based on what the membership has. And at the present time, at least in our area, the league is viewed as being pretty left leaning. In order for us to get into schools across the state, which vary widely, we are not a blue state, we are a purple state. <clears throat> In order to do that, we made the decision that everything that we do is issue agnostic, meaning that we do not take positions, that our goal is to help young people learn how to use the democratic processes that exist, as Donovan is, in order to bring about the changes that they think they want to see in their future. The first one of those helps them identify their burning issue. And Donovan, you said something about, you know, there are so many issues in the world today and kids care about every single one of them. And that is true. 
But if you're going to be effective, what they learn is they have to be able to focus on a single thing and then help uh, realize that others are going to be focusing on other things. Doesn't mean they can't do things around other issues, but if they're going to be a powerful leader, then they are better off if they say, I am going to do this thing and these are the ways that I'm going to get involved. And one, you already have these skills, but most kids in high school and colleges don't. Um, it helps them understand how they can use the political systems, both on the state and national level, but also on the local level, on the county level, as you mentioned, and in the um, even in Board of Education elections, which tend to be pretty hot issues or pretty hot elections in New Jersey right now. It helps them know that they can actually go in and talk and ways they can do that in order to be heard. The last one across the divide came about as a request. Um, the One of the leagues in our state said, uh, we don't know how to converse across the divide anymore. And so two lessons were developed. One was to help young people and, and adults. We've done this with adults too, and it's just as effective. Um, learn that listening is an important skill. And when you listen carefully to hear what somebody is feeling and the content of their, uh, their conversation, you don't have to agree with them. You just have to try to understand where they're coming from. And then the second piece of that is how do I speak so as to be heard? It is to help young people learn that there are ways you can say what's important to you that will make it more likely that somebody will able, be able to listen to you and understand you than to stick their fingers in their ears and say, I don't want to hear what you have to say. The last one, digital citizenship, both media in and media out, is still being piloted, and that will be modified based on the reactions in middle school, high school, and college, um, and then adjusted for each one of those groups to make it effective. These are two pictures of young people involved in that. The top uh, group is the group from Monmouth University who are now ambassadors. They will go back into their communities and use these materials and encourage people to actually become civically engaged around a community issue that they feel they need to change. The group on the right is a group of middle school students who were learning about voting and about the use, the use of digital media to be responsible citizens um, in a middle school near us. Lillian, um, Agnes suggested that I get some testimonials from young people who have gone through these programs. And there are so many of them, but I tried to narrow it down to a couple that I particularly love. The first one is from a student who participated in I Am The Change and in, in the What's Your Issue and I Am The Change. And that student said, I used to think that I could not enact change, that small changes weren't big enough. Now I think I can enact change by starting small. I thought that was pretty insightful. Another one was, I used to think I couldn't take a break, and now I think it's very important to care for my mental health. And I think, Donovan, you mentioned that too, that it can be a real challenge to your mental health at this point in time. And the first one, what's your issue? There is an entire section about young people being engaged politically, seeing the future as pretty dark, and what you need to do in order to protect yourself, if that's the way you're seeing things. <clears throat> and then this third one, I do feel like I have the power to make change. Thanks to seeing who my direct representatives are, learning which means are the best to use the, reach those figures, and brainstorming ideas within my own passions fueled my drive to make change. And then there are some on voting. Something that made a difference to me personally was the struggle of people in the past, especially women in their 20s. It should not go in vain, and people of this generation should really understand that and go vote if they wanna bring change. And I learned that I myself need to become more active and help educate my peers on voting and why it's important. This broke my heart when I first realized that that was uh, what some young people were feeling. This young man identified as Mexican. He was first generation US citizen. He said, I used to think if you were Mexican, you can't vote. But now I know if you're a Mexican and a citizen, you can. And I thought, that's good. 
And there are more. We could go on. This one, I will begin to vote to change the fate of our future, is says it all. Um, I'm going to skip this slide so that we have more time to um, talk, but um, Lillian and uh, Agnes, do you want to talk about one of the things that has been a leadership opportunity for you through energizing young voters? Lily, you're shaking your head. You go first. <laughs> I will definitely start. So something I mentioned earlier was I was a voting delegate on behalf of Monmouth County at the National Convention last summer in Colorado. And something that we were able to do was me and Dr. Supley were able to do a like mini caucus, I guess, or like one of the mini committee conventions. And we got to present the same suffrage timeline you just saw, but in full for all the um, other delegates that were there. And I got to speak about some other issues we had with the timeline when we were piloting it that included more like Gen Z problems, like focusing more on being inclusive and making sure we're following DEI standards and making sure that we have very specifically inclusive language in our, all of our presentations and modules, because um, as minorities, if they see these presentations, if a single word can throw them off, if something that flags in their brain or like a big hit word they see, and they see it and they completely will disregard everything else that has the, what the slide is talking about. So it was important for us to make sure that we are being aware that our language is accepting and inclusive for all people that are going to view it so they can get the full knowledge of the presentation without getting upset or sidetracked by a word or a phrase that we used unintentionally that could cause them to lose their focus. And this is why we need young people on the Young Voters Advisory Board, because it's something that just escaped me. Um, I will say that uh, the timeline of suffrage, when I first worked with another person to help develop that, it was white. And I'm embarrassed to say that now, but it was not anything that I even saw as a problem until the young people became involved. So I thank Lily for that and lots of other things. Agnes, how about you? Um, for me, the biggest leadership position that I've been able to take on um, through Energizing Young Voters is something that you already mentioned, Pat, which is the grant writing um, kind of advising that's been happening with you. Um, grant writing, grant applications and grant use in general is interesting to me. My school does a lot of work, receives a lot of grants, manages a lot of grants. So it's something that's kind of in my orbit. Um, but I had never been on the application side. And so I've been able to work with Pat um, as we spearhead pushing energizing young voters and League of Women Voters materials across the country, like we're doing right now, um, through grants. And that's been really, really valuable. Thanks. Um, before I open it to questions, one of the things I should say is that we don't have any funding other than personal donations. This has all been done with volunteers, particularly volunteers among young people. Um, so I would like you to keep your fingers crossed for us that we get the grant that we have applied for. And um, Agnes is being very modest. She is one of the courses that she is taking is a course to help design a, an ethnographic study in order to determine whether or not the fighting for change actually leads young people to take part in some of the activities. So what we're trying to do is make this more research based. The grant that she and I wrote, or that primarily I, I, it was a short term thing. And so I did a lot on her, you know, skipped her, but that is going to be uh, creating a rigorous study, statistical study to determine if what we know from um, informal pre and post assessments about the increase in students intention to vote is in fact uh, happening. I, I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be yes, but it would be nice to have the statistical backing for that. So um, I think that's it from us, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. And actually, I'm probably going to let them answer them because I think your questions are mo more likely to be directed at the young folks. So Awesome. Well, feel, feel free to use the hand raising feature, folks, or if you want to toss the question right into the chat, I'm happy to queue it up. Um, I'm getting texts, I'm getting messages, and they're all saying what a great presentation this is. Um, will you just remind us, are you presenting this at a lot of high schools? Are you presenting this with leagues? Where, where does this go? Either of you ladies want to take it? <laughs> Lily, 
Uh, actually, I'll jump in on this one. Um, Lily talked about the fact that she did make presentations like this in her high school. Um, we have other people who have done it in other high schools. Um, there are league, I would say it's primarily the initiative of the league, and then we work with young people, and then they take it over. And as I said, we start with one thing, otherwise it feels too overwhelming. Got it. And when you all create this material, is it uh, intended only for your league's use, or is it intended no. for other <laughs> leagues to adapt and use it in, in their local leagues? <laughs> No, actually, it started in one fifth grade classroom uh, with a, a friend presenting this to her granddaughter's class, and it has now spread to pretty much the northern, northeasternmost and southwesternmost parts of New Jersey. We also have leagues in the state of Washington that have two leagues, two areas in Washington state that have adopted it. Um, Boulder County, Colorado League has adopted it. Um, Maricopa County, Arizona has adopted it. Um, and I know I'm missing somebody. Oh, Montana, Helena area in Montana has adopted it. And then we're hoping that you'll consider at least starting with one lesson. And we've also had an inquiry from Pinellas County, Florida. So people are looking for ways to get young people engaged. And I'm hoping this is one of the tools that you can use in a toolbox. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, a lot of big fans of this presentation for sure. So thank you for all your hard work to put that in and to present that information to us. Um, Lily and Agnes, we've got a question from Stacy here. She would love to know more about how you all arrived uh, at, at connecting with the league. Like what is your personal connection to this cause? Lily, do you wanna jump in and then I'll? Yeah, of course. So the first way I met the league was a, they came into my one of my classes. So I'm in like a government pathway, which is around 12 kids in my school. I have around 1700 kids. So it's only like a small select group. And one of the presidents of my Monmouth County um, League, um, she came in and did a short presentation about the league and how they need more youth to be like, they kind of wanted us to get our parents involved. So it was more of a sales pitch for our parents than for us per se. But my friends and I, we loved the info session we got. We reached out to her. And this is the time that we cannot be members yet because we were so young. I was 14 at the time. But, you know, they let us come onto the meetings. They let us, like, do small things. We couldn't vote, like, in any of the voting settings that the league has because of the bylaws. But as we got older, they let us do more things. They, let, they got us involved with Dr. Supley's energizing young voters. And then it's kind of just been history since. As for me, um, I was much older. Like I said, I was 18. Um, I actually took a semester. So I graduated high school in 2020, which was a crazy time to enter the world as an adult. Um, and so I took a semester off before coming to college because it all seemed too crazy to start then. Um, and I was actually living with my grandmother because my family lives overseas. So I stayed back in the States and I lived with my grandmother for six months. Um, and I had not a lot going on in my life, things to do, people to see. <laughs> um, and my mom connected me, right, sorry, not my mom, my grandmother connected me through various people to Pat, um, who um, was starting, was kind of getting energized young voters going and wanted um, a, a young perspective on the presentations, the modules that they were giving. Um, and so I jumped in and yeah, I just kind of never stopped. That's amazing. I'm so glad you found your way to this. We need your generation involved in carrying us forward into the future, telling us where to go next. Uh, looks like we have a question from our other uh, speaker today, Donovan. Donovan, you want to come on and share your question with Energizing Young Voters? Yeah, this question is for Lillian Agnes. So how, like, being a young person in the state, like, how do you stand up for yourself when, like, conflict, like, arises? And then, like, following that, like, how do you think people can avoid, like, making those mistakes in the first place that, like, cause you to, like, have to stand up for yourself as a young person? I think that's a really good question. It kind of reminded me of one of the questions you answered as well. And I think the most important part is listening. Yes, share your point of view, but you also have to be willing to listen to another person and make sure you be respectful. If you feel that something is wrong and you can explain it in a respectful way, don't yell, don't shout, don't talk behind their backs. If you can explain why what they're doing and what they're saying is hurtful, 
or how that you need to stand out or what you need to do and you listen respectfully, it will go both ways and you will be end up being a better person in the end and so will they. I am engaged in a lot of conflict transformation work at my school. Um, Middlebury College received a grant for conflict transformation. And so there are classes, there are programs, there's activities, there's lots of things going on. And I'm taking a course, it's just like an introduction course to conflict transformation. And the whole idea of CT, which I'll call it because otherwise those words are long and they get jumbled. Um, the whole concept of CT is that conflict is an inevitable, inevitable part of our life and using it productively and progressively is the only way to move through that conflict. Um, and so I, so when you were saying that Donovan, that how do we move through, um, someone says something you're like, Ooh, that makes me shrivel up. That makes me not want to engage. The way to move forward is kind of a mix. Well, kind of what you were saying, Lily is to say, okay, I'm going to listen. We're going we're gonna to hear what this is. Why does that make me feel the way it feels? Why are you saying that? And then how can we both come out of this with more than we came into it with? So how can I come out of it understanding why you said that? And how can that other person come out understanding why I feel this way? We might not change our minds. That person might continue to, be say, continue to say something that makes me feel the way it feels. Um, but at least we move through it with a little bit more understanding of one another um, because those conflicts are just a part of everyday life. They're not going to go away magically. Um, and so learning to use them rather than be shut down by them is super important. That concept of empathy keeps coming back throughout today's session, doesn't it? Um, Donovan, I hope you don't mind. I put you back in the spotlight here because uh, we're close to time, but I'd love to close out the session with one thing. One thing each from each of our speakers today that you want us to take away from the conversation we've had today about Gen Z voters at the ballot box. What do you want to leave us with? Uh, maybe I'll start with Donovan, just since you were on first and have had a lot of time to think about all of your great big points. What's your big message? I would say my message is that young people aren't apathetic to the system and don't want to not be engaged. We have to do better to meet them where they're at and realizing the obstacles that they face in order to accomplish our shared goal of being more civilly engaged. Mm, wonderful. Pat? Oh, Pat, we can't hear you. <laughs> Surprise! That, that was my uh, New Year's resolution about two years ago. I was not going <laughs> to speak until the <laughs> unmute button was there, and I'm still learning anyway. Yeah, same. Um, my the thing that I'd like you to take away is that you as individuals and you as leagues can make this kind of change begin to happen. You can motivate young people in a way that will, I hope, bring about the change in the world that it should be for their generation, not our generation. Amazing. Lily? Gen Z is not that different than people think they are passionate and they want to be heard and that we have everyone else just has to be willing and open as well as us to be reciprocal is that we need to just listen to everybody we need to respect them and we need to understand that they are not being radical they are not doing these crazy stances to cause a mess or to cause havoc they want to be heard and because we have been so oftenly suppressed they are going to take more radical stances than ever seen before but they are doing it out of kindness and they want to do their civic duties, which have been told that we have to do from the very beginning. Thank you. Agnes, you want to bring us home? Um, yes, I would close with the fact that while, not while, yes, Gen Z is, politic is not politically apathetic. We are engaged, we are excited, we want to get involved. We are also coming of age in a time of incredible turmoil, um, ecological, disasters, um, changes in the national landscape on abortion, um, questions of gender, um, race are happening all around us. We have, you know, we have these phones in our hands at all times that have the world flying at us in 12 different directions. And so our engagement and the way we get engaged and how we engage is going to be different than yours is, than our parents is, than our grandparents is. Um, and that's important to notice uh, to note um it's overwhelming but it can be used productively and our engagement it matters because we're gonna just keep existing we're gonna keep getting older every year and more people are gonna come behind us so 
our engagement is 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 unique, but it is not radical. Um, and uh, we're gonna keep voting. Ooh, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. What an amazing session. Now, all of you speakers, I don't know if you know this, today is my last meeting as chair of this committee because we're welcoming a new uh, committee chair, Lisa Albright, onto uh, committee leadership. And I am just so thrilled at this program as my last one, my last hurrah, just huge epic content. So thankful for everything you educated us with. I know you just made about 45, 50 new fans over the course of this session. Um, so uh, energizing young voters, folks, how can people connect with you online? Uh, where where can they find you? Um, I put in the chat, energizingyoungvoters.com is our website, and there is a contact form on there, or you can email us at energizingyoungvoters at gmail.com. Um, either way, you'll get to me, and then I can direct you to the right place. <laughs> Amazing. Wonderful. Uh, awesome. So I am going to switch it over to our closing announcements. Everybody, please send your thanks and any remaining questions into uh, the chat to, to thank Energizing Young Voters, Loud Light, Donovan, Agnes, Lily, Pat. Thank you so much for your time on this uh, fine Saturday morning. Uh, let me switch gears here to our final wrap-up announcements. Bear with me as I am moving slowly. Okay, share screen, and we're back. Okay, so allegedly, anyway. All right, we had an awesome program on Gen Z at the ballot box. Thank you to Donovan Dillon, Patricia Supley, Lily Hardwick, Agnes Roach Simpson. Uh, a few final news and call to action items. Uh, we have our social media minute with Judy Ann Goldman. Is there anything in particular you'd like us to do on social media today, Judy Ann? Hey, yeah, thank you. And yeah, thanks to all the speakers. You were amazing. This was, wow, yeah, Heather. Awesome, awesome final presentation. And just thanks to, to all the speakers. I learned a lot and we'll go forward with that information. Um, so yeah, we would love you. If you're not following us, um, please follow on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is where you'll find these meetings. Um, so you can go back and listen to the inspiring messages and advice. Um, and uh, so we take a minute right now to actually do that. So so do it. <laughs> go ahead. I'm going to put some of the live links um, to make it even that much easier for you to do it. I also uh, wanted to give a shout out. We had a little bit of news this week. Um, we had a team that, uh, created, or Anne, I don't know if you're going to mention this. I don't want to, or, or Heather as Anne's voice. Um, we, my dog uh, started barking, but, um, what was the last thing you said? We, uh, we were our, an award winner. We have a new award under our belt. Um, we had an amazing team of folks who um, put together a, a transit communication. So on billboards, messages to vote and about the league on buses and um, the company Ad Exposure, Ad Exposure, sorry, gives transit awards um, in all the cities where they operate. And um, we were the Kansas City Award winner for the Community Awareness Award. So big thanks to, to Anne and Rita and Sandy um, and Katie. Special kudos to Katie Frankenbach, who actually designed the, uh, the image that was shown on buses all around Kansas City. Amazing news. Way to go, Katie. Way to go, team. Congratulations on the award. And so I'm putting these in here. If anybody has any questions, anything uh, about our social media accounts, anything like that, uh, please let us know. There are a few accounts, so there are a lot of links here. 
Um, Sounds good. So um, in the interest of time, since we're at 1130, I'll just go ahead and roll through announcements. Everybody click those links in the chat, engage, like, share, subscribe, all the things. Uh, uh, just a uh, remind, I am fake Becky today. Becky couldn't be here today. She'll be watching later. I think she's going to love the program. Um, but I'm standing in for her today to remind everybody that there are lots of exciting upcoming voter registration opportunities in the area. Um, she's got a lot of stuff in store for the Nelson Atkins, the Kaufman, and all sorts of exciting places around Kansas City. Uh, some of the next ones coming up uh, are early May, and we still need a handful more uh, volunteers. It's very easy to do. Just go to lwvkc.org, log in, click volunteer, and sign up for the dates that work for you. Please do get involved. And then uh, I already mentioned that I am the outgoing member meetings chair. Hopefully Lisa's on here. Lisa Albright is the new incoming me member meetings chair. You'll be able to reach her at the same place you used to reach me, membership meetings at lwvkc.org. Um, there is no standard LWVKC monthly meeting in May because the state convention is on the 6th and our annual KC meeting is on the 13th. Uh, and five ways to engage slide didn't get finished, which is completely my fault, but a uh, reminder that uh, we do still need uh, a chair of the fundraising committee and it's totally okay if it is a, a joint chair effort as well um and i feel like you had an announcement i was supposed to cover and then i somehow deleted the slide um uh, <laughs> i'm hoping you can drop in the chat what that was so i don't forget it yes it was in the email i put it in the slide now what did i do with it Ah, here we go. Okay. So uh, the announcement was that uh, the annual meeting is coming up and we're going to be voting in officers, members of the board of directors, changes to the bylaws, programming for next year or the next year and a half and more. Uh, and so the information is going to be coming out about that meeting on April 14th, which is less than a week away. So be sure to check that email. Uh, the annual meeting will be May 6th from 9.30 a.m. social time to noon in the Northeast branch of the Kansas City Public Library. And uh, the group does plan to go out to lunch afterwards as well. And I'm sure, I'm sorry, uh, May 13th, May 13th, April 13th. Uh, I'm not sure what we're talking about right now. And uh, the dates. If I can step in here, May, May the 6th is the state meeting. Um, which we need delegates for, and then May thirteenth is the is our league's meeting. Got it. That you just yes. Okay, so I'll drop that in the chat. May sixth, state convention in Columbia. We need delegates. May thirteenth, uh, annual meeting right here in Kansas City. All right. Good deal. Uh, and I'm sure all that information is also posted on the lwvkc.org calendar. Uh, otherwise, I think we have covered all of our exceptional material today. This has been recorded, so it'll be up on YouTube if you or someone you know would like to rewatch it afterward. Thank you again to our wonderful guests, everyone on the League of Women Voters Kansas City, and have a great month. We'll see you next time.